Come on. Come on, man. So good. Thank you so much. Can we say thank you to the worship team just crushing it today? So good. Church, we are so blessed. Truly, we are so, so blessed by staff, by our volunteers. We pray for our volunteers every week. We are pumped for people who choose to, to come. And you guys are just a part of this church, and we're so grateful for that. And we're just so thankful to our worship team that puts in a lot of time. Our volunteers over at Kingdom Kids that just crush it for the kids over there, just having a blast. And we are just pumped that you, you are here today. We mean that. We're excited that you find yourself right here. And what a morning so far, man. An incredible, incredible day here at Believer's Chapel. And we're excited. You could find yourself anywhere right now, especially on a holiday weekend. And you spend time with us here. And we're honored by that. We thank you for that. We love you. And uh, man, if we could just get right into John, please. John chapter 1. And we're going to get to a couple places. Continuing in our, our grace series, the depth of grace. I mean, how is it that you come to a place to try to truly figure out the depth of grace. You try to come to this place to understand my sin for his grace because he loves me. And we covered this last week in the sense of why, what makes grace so amazing. And it is the, the, the deep understanding of our sin and what we rightfully deserved was death for the wages of sin is death. That's what we've earned. Every single person, we learned last week, every single person who's ever breathed has a death sentence uh, because of sin. That's what we rightfully should get. That's what we deserve, had it not been for the grace of God. And when you, when you begin to break this down and you begin to know the depth and the reality of how much God loves us, that he's truly covered us in his grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast. We have, there's going to be no bragging in heaven. Please hear me. No one's bragging in heaven how they got there besides every one of us on our face, hands high before a holy God, to be amazed that worthy is the lamb who was slain and to walk in this place to be amazed at Jesus because it was by the grace of God and it was by uh, us believing in Christ by faith. It's just, the exchange is unbelievable, church. And when you walk in this place to try to do a study on grace, the Bible is just full, full of grace and, and trying to maybe end this next week. Maybe we'll go one more week. Next week is going to be great. Don't miss it next week as we talk about our conduct matters in grace. As recipients of grace, do, do we give others grace as well? As, as the understanding of what it means to be a recipient of grace, when, when we carry ourselves, what does our conduct say? First Corinthians, uh, we're going to take a, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians, we're going to take a look at that next week and just the reality of our conduct in, in a sense of grace in a sense of how we really treat other people. And I'm, I'm so pumped to see grace in action for the church. What does it look like that a church lives by grace and extends grace? I'm excited for this. I'm excited for this for next week. Um, man, I hope that you've all truly had a great week. I hope that you find yourself in God's word. I hope that you find yourself on your face in prayer. I hope that you are growing in your faith as we continue to pray for you and pray for where we're at as, as an individual, where we're at as a husband, where we're at as a wife, where we're at as, as a, a child, as a teenager, as a young adult, as a college student, where we're at as one who is single yet in adult years. Like, are we, are we growing in our faith? Is it going from faith to faith? Do we walk in this place? And I am hoping that today just might be one of those rebound messages that you walk in a place to say today changed something. Listen, I believe our God wants to move in our spirits in such a powerful way. Every time, every time you get into his word, his word can never come back void. Day after day after day, I believe God wants to do something truly in your spirit when you study his word. But when we gather as a family, let there be an anointing in this place that when we walk out on a Sunday morning, we're different, we're changed. We've allowed God to do a work. And I hope that, that today is that day. That when we see this beautiful, amazing picture of what it means that his grace comes again and 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 his grace comes again, that the, one of the big ideas today is that you cannot exhaust his grace. What happens when you come to a place to see it in Scripture, but yet, but yet, but yet, here it is, walk in this place to believe that it's true. Because you can get pounded, and you get pounded, and you get pounded, and you get pounded, and you get pounded, and then you hear the good news, and you've been pounded so much, you don't want to believe the good news. 
Have we been there? Honestly, church, have we been there that you get pounded and you get pounded and the enemy pounds you and the enemy pounds you and then sin piles up and sin piles up and sin piles up and the enemy pounds you and he pounds you and you walk in his place. When you hear today how amazing his grace is that it is good and it is for you and it's extended again and again and again and again. Is it hard to actually believe it because you've been so pounded? I want you to see it today in such a way that you are different no matter how long you've been saved. That you walk out of this place saying, God, you spoke to me today. God, you spoke to me today. Come on, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this moment. Lord, I just pray that you would move in a powerful way through this service, through your word, our acknowledgement of you, and that we honor you and exalt you in this house. And God, I pray in this moment that you would speak to us for every person that's in this house, every person that's online. Every person would ever hear this. God, make it alive to us today, please. Lord, make it alive to us in our spirit that we would be moved in our spirit by your spirit today because of your word. In Jesus' name, come on, amen. I love it, I love it. Come on, John 1. John 1, we're going to look at just a little bit here. It says this, John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. I like this, and you walk in this place to, to, to understand in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and he, the word, was in the beginning with God. That's, whoo, that's an amazing start to John 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God. I, I love this, watch this. And the word was God, so you've got the word. The word was with God. Actually, in all reality, the word was God. And then you see in, in verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. That's Jesus. As apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's, that, I mean, that's theology right there. There's a lot in those first few verses. Uh, you're speaking on even the Trinity in that. You're speaking on a lot of different areas of the reality of in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And then we're going to get to verse 14 in a minute. And it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So you, so you, you, you got to get the, the depth of Jesus here. You've got to get the depth of the one who was a huge piece of creation as he is, he is the creator. All things were made him for him and through him, Colossians 1, 16. And when you, when you begin to understand that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three had a big part in creation. And then, and then they created the heaven and the earth. We know that here, the word beginning, it speaks of origin. It doesn't mean that this was the start to Jesus. This just simply means that in the the beginning was the word was with God because we see in John 17 where Jesus says, listen, restore to me that place before the world was formed. And we see in Revelation, he says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I've always been and I always will be. This is the reality to Jesus. But the, the big picture, I'm saying all that because verse 14, it has to come alive to us. When you begin to see that Jesus has always been, and you begin to see there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three, a big, huge piece of all of creation that, that they actually created and put flesh on us, and then all of a sudden, there is this moment in time that the very one who created entered his creation. The very one who created flesh on oh man, put flesh on himself. Church, that is stunning. That is stunning. Because you have this understanding. You, you, you got to get this understanding of what it means that the word became flesh and then it says this most amazing thing, and dwelt among us, John 1, 14. What does it look like that he dwelt among us? That it actually literally means like a tabernacle, like a, like a place. Like, like, like the place that people would go and dwell. Like this is, this is what this means as Jesus came and he dwelt among us. Like he, he moved into your neighborhood. 
tabernacle is a tent. Tabernacle is a place that people would go. And the reality is when you understand that the word became flesh, Jesus, who is God, who is creation, that which he created, he entered into his creation for the purpose of dwelling among us, to be among us, to move in to our neighborhood and to be a part of that which he created. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And then church, what happens? What happens when you understand the depth of John 1? And then you see this picture in John 1, 14, and it says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And here's what John, this is John the apostle. Uh, John 1 references John the Baptist, which is Jesus' cousin, right? You've got Mary, you've got Elizabeth, the whole Christmas story. Mary's all juiced about being pregnant. She goes to her other cousin, who's Elizabeth, who couldn't get pregnant. Now she's pregnant. Everybody's celebrating. Woo, it's amazing. Uh, Mary greets Elizabeth. John leaps in Elizabeth's womb, and it's like, oh, it's amazing. And then John uh, prophesied from the Old Testament. He's the one that is coming from the wilderness as the forerunner to Jesus. So John is a big deal. John the Baptist is a big deal. He comes out of the wilderness and camel hair and eating bugs. Okay. <laughs> Chocolate covered bugs, possibly. I don't know. Um, I mean, they had to have chocolate, right? I mean, everybody like, you can't live without chocolate. Old Testament, New Testament. They had, they had cocoa beans, right? I'm sure they had chocolate. It's a delicacy. It's amazing. Chocolate covered ants, delicacy, eat them all. But you walk in this place to see where John the Baptist was a big deal. And there's places where you see in scripture where he says, listen, I'm unfit because John became a big deal. And then you've got Jesus and John at the same time. And, G and John had to defer and say, listen, it's time for me to decrease and it's time for him to increase. I'm not even worthy to tie the man's shoes. And you see, this is John the apostle who's writing this. And you got to understand Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all books written fairly recent after the cross. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, authors of these books, and they, they, they were written very, very recent after the cross. The, the book of John was actually written between 60 or even 80 years after Jesus. So John's going into this, this place. But he says something huge here that I don't want you to miss. The apostle John says that that the word put on flesh and dwelt among us. This is, this is, now you got to remember John, John the Baptist was beheaded. So he was kind of out of the scene. He wasn't even considered a disciple. He wasn't considered an apostle, a part of the 12 anyways. He certainly was a disciple in the sense of a follower of Jesus, John the Baptist. So you've got, you've got John the apostle says this, he dwelt among us. And then he, and then he makes this amazing statement. He says, and we saw his glory. We saw his glory. Now listen, let me, let me highlight the word glory. Circle that, highlight that, underline it, write some definitions around this, this word. This word glory is this kind of this, this one huge umbrella word. It covers so many of the attributes of who, who our God is in the sense that the word glory, it means, it means excellence. It means his radiance, his brilliance, his brightness. It's his majesty. It's his power. It's his authority. So this, this one word, when, when John says, and we saw his glory, you could just zip right past that and go, cool, they saw his glory. What's that mean? Now, John goes back to a place as the apostle and as the disciple is one of the top three. Jesus had the top 12, and then Jesus had the top three of the top 12. Now, I'm not saying clicks are okay in the sense of bullying or, or separating people, but guess who had a pretty good click? Jesus. And John was a part of that top three click. So you could imagine when John saw, says we saw his glory. What did John see? 
What is the word glory? In the sense of we saw his majesty, we saw his excellence, we saw his brilliance, we saw his power, we saw his authority. This is what we saw. Now listen, you've got this amazing gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament of 400 years, and you've got these, 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 these Jewish men. They knew the Old Testament. They studied and read the Old Testament. You've got these, these guys, meaning John, he, he knew about what the glory of the Lord looked like from reading the Old Testament. When God split the Red Sea, when, when, when God allowed you to walk on dry ground, when you could see miracle after miracle and read about it and read about it and read about it. And then all of a sudden, John, the New Testament saying that was good to read about it, but we saw it. We saw his power. We saw his excellence. We saw his majesty, his brilliance, amazing. And John 2 gives us a little picture in this. John 2, 11, it's the first miracle where Jesus turns water into wine at the wedding feast. And this is this amazing power. He's like, hey, bring the jugs and fill them and fill them again. We need more. We need, got to get more juice, man. We need more juice. We got to fill them. But listen, we've ran out, man. There isn't anything left. This is an embarrassment to the family. And Jesus says, I got this. Well, Jesus' mom says, my son's got this. She's like, mom, really? You know, moms give that look, right? I mean, Jesus didn't argue. with was, mom, I'm not ready yet. Mary gives the look. And the next thing you know, I mean, it's amazing because Jesus is like, mom, I'm not, it's not my time. Next thing you know, he's turning all these barrels into wine. Who won that one, right? Good job, mom. But the Bible says in John 2, 11, it says this. He manifested his glory. So when John says we saw his glory. And remember, when you, when you read the Gospels, these are all the events. They know everything. It's not like John 1 was written before anything that took place in John 2. you got to understand that. When, when he says we saw his glory, he's, he's counting on this, this water to wine miracle, saying it was a manifest. And John's the same writer from John 1 to John 2. He says he manifested his glory. It, it, he, he manifested it. He, we saw his glory in what? In, in him performing a miracle. So when you, when you look at the understanding of this and what's it look like, and, and the, the, this is huge for where we're going in just a minute, that you would understand where John, totally amazed in the majesty and the excellence and the power and the authority of Jesus, where he says, listen, we actually saw his glory. Could, could you imagine us being on a boat? This is John. Could you imagine where we're on this boat? We're all thinking we're going to die. The storm is going crazy, and Jesus is sleeping in the boat. They said, hey, 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 wake up. What's going on? Hey. Hush, be still. We saw his power. We saw his glory. And then that, that, that time, do you remember that time when, when we were just walking, all of a sudden Jesus goes and he interrupts his funeral. And you've got this, this dead boy in a casket from a widow, it's your only son. And they're carrying the widow and they're going to the burial. All of a sudden, Jesus, Jesus shows up. Church, what happens when Jesus shows up? Things change. And he stops the pressure the, 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 the pressure and all, and he comes to this place to touch his hand to the coffin and said, young man, I say to you, arise. Could you imagine, could you imagine this scene when this boy sits up and speaks? We saw his glory. You can imagine when people are starving and they say they don't even know if they have enough energy to make it home. And Jesus is like, I got this. I'm going to feed the 5,000 with nothing, with a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread. All I need you to do is distribute it, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't run out. We've seen arms grow back. We've seen leprosy be gone. We've seen blind eyes see. We've seen... The demon possessed, healed. We've seen it. We've seen, we've seen his glory. And this is, please hear this. John is making this amazing declaration. And then in verse 14, he says this. And we saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten. That's the uniqueness of Jesus from the Father, full, watch this, full of grace and truth out of everything that we have seen. He is full of grace and truth. 
They've seen his compassion and they've seen his mercy to the outcast. They've seen to the sinner. They've, they've seen it over and 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 over. And they've walked in this place to say, we have seen the full of grace and truth. Now watch this, watch this. Verse 15 says this. And John, this is John the baptizer now. John testified about Jesus crying out, saying, this was of he whom I said, he who comes after me has higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now this is amazing when you break this down. Again, it speaks to the preexistence of Jesus as God. Because who, who was born first, John the Baptist or, or, John, or Jesus Christ? The, the, it was it the, truly the son of Elizabeth or the, was the son of Mary that was born first. It was the son of Elizabeth that's six months older. And yet here John is, is speaking in reference to his, 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 his importance and who he is. I can't even tie his sandals. He's, he's up here and I'm down here and I understand that. And I love this. Why is that? Because he existed before me. In reality of a human timeline, no, he didn't. But in an eternal timeline, it screams of who Christ is in his eternal existence. And this is all John writing. He says this, watch this. And then John says this, for of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Listen, we've seen the miracles and we've seen his glory and we've seen his power and we've seen his might and then he comes to this place right here right here he says this I love where he's at in verse 16 for his fullness we have all we have all received grace upon grace John 1 16 I want you to see it in the amplified because this is Church, this is such a big deal that when you understand grace upon grace, you understand we come to him a grace and we come again and get grace and we come again and get grace and we come again and get grace and we come again and we get, come, get, come again and get grace. And I love what we were singing this morning that we run to the Father again and again and again and again and again. And this is what the Amplified says. And I, I'm a big fan of the Amplified version. I'm a big fan of the NASB. I'm a big fan of ESV. And I'm a big fan of the Amplified. Those are my top three. Uh, of what I really study from. And I love this. For out of his fullness, watch this, out of his fullness. Church, that, that doesn't lack. Grace never has lack. And when you understand that, as much as we've been pounded, as much as sin can pile on, grace never has lack. Remember last week where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. You can never exhaust grace. Watch what it says. For out of his fullness, the superabundance. I love that. The superabundance of his grace and truth. We have all received grace upon grace. Spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing. Favor upon favor and gift heaped. I love that word heaped. Heaped upon gift. Let me get it again. Spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing. Favor upon favor and gift heaped upon gift. And church, what does this look like when you think about grace upon grace? Sometimes, like we walk in this understanding that, well, this must be for the superheroes of faith. This must be for everybody who's got it together. This must be for the SWAT team who's Jesus and his special team. This must be for the Green Berets of faith. This must be for SEAL Team 6 of Jesus followers who just, they always do it right. Their whole neighborhood is saved. Their whole house is saved. The marriage is perfect. This must be just for them. All I'm trying to do is just get rid of my addiction. I'm trying to go one day without using drugs. I'm trying to go one day and not deal with my drunkenness. I'm trying to go one day and not looking at porn. I'm just trying to get by. Who is this really for? And church, this is where we go wrong. Because it says this fullness, watch this please, this is huge. We have all received grace upon grace. Maybe we're in that boat. We're just trying to get by one more day. I'm just trying to get by one more day. Are you saying that's for me? Grace piled on top of grace. 
His gift heaped on top of gift. Blessing upon blood. Are you saying that's for me? Yes. 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 As we etch out one more day, as we walk in that place to understand who we are in Christ, there is this depth to grace, to know it's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. I come to you again, and I come to you again, and I come to you again. Come on, church, what did Jesus say? Forgive 70 times seven, it's 490. You think that doesn't apply to him? And we come again, 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 and we come again. Church, what happens when you understand the depth of this meaning of grace? Grace literally means his kindness, his favor, his blessing. But I want you to hear this. Please hear this. There's a deeper tie to this word grace. His kindness, his favor, his blessing. But this is what the deeper meaning is. Watch this. Please hear this. It means he leans towards us. Grace, if you can get this picture today, grace is this picture of God's kindness leaning towards us. Church, isn't it amazing that we have a father that when we sin, he doesn't back away from us. I think so many times, honestly, we we see that we have this God that when we sin, he, he, he he actually takes steps away from his sons and daughters. That's not grace. It literally means he leans towards us. You mean when I sin as his son or his daughter, he actually... He actually leans in. Grace. It literally means he leans towards us to extend his kindness and his favor, his compassion, his mercy. It's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. So it's what happens when you can paint this proper picture as John has of how great Jesus is. How majestic and powerful and beautiful. And in the same time, so tender and so caring now we're just trying to get through one more day. I'm just trying not to be drunk today. I struggle. I'm just trying not to do this. I'm just trying not. Man, it could be a real struggle with your tongue. I'm just trying not to talk about someone today. That can be a real struggle. Probably one of the biggest struggles that we deal with is our tongue. We love to talk about people. I'm just trying to just one more day not sin with my tongue. Grace. You mean that's that's for me? Church, please hear this. Do you have like a a a, a trickle mindset? Which means this little, little little mindset, or do you have this abundance mindset? Do you, do you have this? Do you, if you have this, what I mean by trickle is just like, it's, it, like his grace can't be for me. What was me? His grace isn't enough for me. Man, I've blown it so many times. There's no way that he could cover me again. Or do you actually walk in this place to understand the biblical truth to this? That it's grace abounding to grace. That it's grace abounding to grace. That it's grace abounding to grace. Why, watch this Ephesians 1. At 1 8 says that he lavishes us with his grace. I love the word lavish. It means that he pours out in abundance. Church, when it comes to grace, we must have this abounding, abundance mindset or we just won't get it right. I think one of the biggest things that we deal with today 
is one of the biggest things that Jesus dealt with in his day here on the earth. And that's that legalistic mind. It's that rules of do and don't. Listen, the law was important for Old Testament that set things in straight for our benefit. But when Jesus came, he changed everything. It's now everything through Christ. It's now everything through Jesus. And when you walk in this place to be legalistic, when you walk in this place to just want to point out everybody's fault, everybody's sin. Well, you did this, you did this. No way, you can be a Christian because you did this and you did that and you did this and I saw you do this and I saw you do that. And it's this pharisaical, it's this legalistic and I think it's one of the one of the true issues we have in church today, not BC, I'm saying church as a whole. And it was the issue that Jesus had to punch in the face repeatedly. I'm better than that person. Oh, look at, whoo, I was there. Church, I think it's one of those things that we miss. We miss grace when we're always wanting to be the ones pointing the finger. When we, we want to be pointing out everyone's faults and we want to be that legalistic mindset. We miss it. We miss it. We miss it. I want you to truly have a change today in our soul and our spirit that you come to a place to begin to dive into the depth of his grace and it is for you. And his grace goes from grace to grace. And, and last week we, we covered Romans 5 and got into Romans 6 just briefly because I think there is this idea where 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 Paul writes this very clearly. Grace doesn't mean license to sin. So we can just sin because of grace. What is Paul? Paul's answer to that is absolutely not. You're missing the picture of grace. And I've been saying this for years. And for me personally, this is my litmus test for me personally is when, when I feel like I have taken grace for granted. if I ever become okay with being okay with sin. Sean, how do I know if I've walked in that place where I've taken grace for granted? I get it. I've sinned. There's grace. I've sinned. There's grace. I've sinned. There's grace. I've sinned. There's grace. I'm just trying to get through one more day. I'm just trying to not have that one last drink. I'm just trying to not to put that needle in my arm. I'm just trying and I'm trying. I'm trying. When is it? When is that that sin overtake grace? Never. But the line is this, is when you become okay with being okay with sin, then you need to recheck your faith and then you need to walk in this place and say, how far have I gone that I'm just simply okay with my sin? I believe that is that line that we need to truly check our faith because you should never be okay with being okay with sin in our lives. Church, what is it for the heart of the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, that Jesus truly is grace and truth? And truth just simply means, it's, it's the Greek word aletheia, and it's, it simply just means that which is sincere, that which is of reality, that which is true, which means it opposes illusion which means it, it's not a lie. It means it's not fake. That, that's, that's what truth here means. Same word in John 14, 6, when, when Jesus said, listen, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's the same, same word. Listen, I'm the reality. Anything outside of me is fake. Anything outside of me is a counterfeit. When you attach grace with truth, anything outside of grace is a counterfeit. Listen, people, we've been lied to in that sense of, listen, when, when you understand biblical truth, for by grace you have been saved through faith that's not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. It's a free gift. Listen, nobody's going to take credit in heaven. There's not one person going, I got here. Hey, I did it. 
I did it. I made it. He must have seen my goodness. He must have seen my good acts. It's amazing we're going to all, who are blood bought through the blood of Christ, going to get to heaven. And there's one position we take, and it's not, and I did this. It's, I'm amazed, and we're going to be on our face in worship before a holy God who came to this place to know that Jesus is worthy as the lamb who was slain. And we're going to be in this amazing place of worship to realize we had nothing to do with it. But it was truly only by his grace. And I can't live by the rules of regulations to try to get to heaven. No, Jesus says, no, it's, it's grace and it's truth. Anything outside of grace is an illusion. It's an illusion. It's fake. And we know that there is Jesus and then the counterfeit to Jesus is Satan. Satan will always counterfeit what God does. walking in this place and we'll close with, with this verse it'll be a minute in just a second Hebrews 14 6 for of his fullness that means it's complete grace and truth are made complete they don't lack Church, this is truly amazing good news. Again, when you've been pounding, you've been pounding, and sin begins to pile up, you need the good news to realize that grace abounds above that sin, and grace can be the crack to that sin, and it can, it can break that foundation. It can crack that foundation of sin, and to realize, no, 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 no. It's by grace. It's only by grace. And, and watch this. Today, there is a freedom you understand the depth of grace. Sometimes, sometimes we want to fight and we want to try and we want to try and we want to fight and we want to fight and we want to fight and we want to do and we want to do and we want to do and we want to do. And Jesus is like, would you please let grace do its work? Would you please just let grace do its work? Let it lavish on you. That's amazing. You know what? Real quick. We'll go to two different verses. we got two, four minutes. Here we go. Maybe six. Ephesians 1. Watch this. Ephesians 1, verse 7. And in him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according, watch this, according to the riches. Look at how grace is defined. According to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. Verse 8. The riches, there's the depth of his grace. Can I encourage you today to let grace do its job? He said, I love you and I need you to understand this because we can try and 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 we can try try until we stop. allow the riches of his grace to be poured out on us to be lavished that means in abundance again and again and again and again well Sean how do I get there Hebrews 4.16 says this Watch this. Therefore, let us draw near. Watch this. Let us draw near with confidence. Can I just share? As, as I get this picture in my head right now. As, as so many times we see, please hear me. We see when we sin, we see the Father wanting to back away from us. When in all reality, grace means that He leans into us. But who don't don't raise your hand? But who can attest that when we sin, sometimes we actually want to back away from the Father? as if he doesn't know. When, when, when we sin, 
Well, we're the ones who are like, I don't even think I can get on my knees today because of my sin. I, I don't even think I can come before him. I can't even read the Bible. I just, I, I know, I know sin in my life. And, and, and we're the ones who actually back away. In all reality, watch, therefore let us draw near. With what, a cowardice? Timid? Now let us draw near with confidence, boldly. To what? The throne of grace. That's us coming to him. And what is the promise guarantee of that? Watch this. So that you may receive mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. Church, this is stunning. Instead of when, when sin comes in and when, when we walk in that place of sin, it causes us to back away saying, ah, I, I, I feel so dirty. I can't even get on my, I can't really come before the Father. Man, that is just a lie from the enemy. We're told the opposite. We're told to boldly, confidently come to what? The throne of grace. Why do we come to the throne of grace? Because we need grace. And what do you receive? Mercy. That's his compassion. And you receive grace. Because he will be there in your time of need. Church, this is such good news. This is such good news. Come off of you just bow your heads just for a moment. Where are you in this today? Come on, I need a shift in your spirit. Not even just in your mind, but in your spirit. Say, God, I need this picture of of true grace, the reality of grace, not the illusion, not something fake, but grace. That when I sin, man, I want to charge the throne. I want to charge the throne quickly. I want to come confident and I want to come bold. To your throne of grace and I will receive mercy. I will receive grace because there you are leaning into me. Amazing. Amazing. Father, we love you. We're amazed by you. We just have this picture in our spirit of as we come to you, there you are, Lord, leaning into us, waiting to lavish us with the richness of your grace. Your grace is so deep. It's so amazing. Lord, we love you. I pray that there would be a a true sense of good news today. That your grace would lavish on us and that would be the true picture that we would see. Grace upon grace upon grace and we come to you again and again and again and again and again to receive grace. God, you're amazing. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. In Jesus' name. Come on, amen. Amen. Man, so good. Hey, next week is going to be another great week. Invite somebody, bring some family as we just continue with grace. If anybody needs prayer for any reason, man, we'd love to pray with you today. If you want to hear more about Jesus, we love talking about Jesus. Uh, We'd love, I'll have some people up here to pray with you. And if you want prayer for any reason, come on up and we'd love to pray with you. Come on, God bless you. Hey, have a great fourth. Remember, no seek tonight, but we'll see you next Sunday. Come on, bring somebody.